Hey everyone, and welcome to the show. Today I've got Georgina here. Georgina's in Tanzania, and there's a it's a seven hour time difference, so that's why uh, it's really dark in her house. And um, and she also she just upgraded her internet, so we're hoping that it's going to work okay. But we're you know we're on the fence about that. And uh, Georgina, thank you for thank you for joining us here on the show. This will be both on YouTube and on the podcast. Oh, fantastic. No, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So we know each other because you are a storyteller on Donor C. Um, yeah. But also you have like a whole history beyond from before that. And I want to start with that before we get mm -hmm. into what you're doing now. So okay. why, don't, why don't you tell everyone you have an accent. You're not from America. Yeah. So <laughs> where, where are you from and uh, what's your um, backstory? My parents are, uh, my mum's Canadian and my dad's British. I was born in the UK, but I actually left when I was seven years old and kind of had a bit of a whirlwind life, mostly in an island called Cyprus in Europe. But I lived in the States for a little while. Um, and my, my dad actually took me out of school when I was 16. And we traveled around Nepal and India for mm. a year. And I guess that's an important part of my story because it definitely uh, shaped the direction I kind of went in in life to, to, to a big degree. I then landed back in the UK and not for very long, though, and then I was off again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've always been overseas, I guess. Um, yeah. So tell me about your time in, you said, India and Nepal. Yeah. So when I was 16, um, my dad had this kind of, we were living in the US, his wife, uh, his family lived out there and they were just selling up everything. And my dad sort of said, we were at this really weird time. I just graduated from, I guess, the British version of high school. And um, my dad said, you know, let's just go do something different. And so uh, we did. Mm -hmm. And we drove around Europe for a few months. And then my dad and I backpacked down India and Nepal. And that was like, a, I didn't do school. That was my education for that time. And it totally shifted my whole, I think, outlook on life. I was 16 and I kind of got a couple of uh, quick lessons on privilege, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but also I was really captivated by people and especially the young people I met, my sort of people my own age. I had some huge experiences the whole time meeting other 15, 16 year old girls whose lives were very different to mine. And it kind of woke me up to something very different. And I don't think it ever changed from there on. I, I, totally changed my whole direction, I guess, in life. Yeah. How yeah. old were you when you were I was 16. In... I was 15, 16. I had my birthday over that period, yeah. And, and how long were you over there? We were um, away for a total of just shy of nine months in total. Okay, so that's a long time. Because when I was yeah. in uh, ninth grade, so when I was 14, I went to Kenya for two weeks. Okay. And I think that that helped influence the direction of my life, but probably not as starkly yeah. as a nine-month trip overseas. Yeah. It was funny because when I turned 18, I, I ended up calling up my dad one day and I said, Dad, I've booked a flight to Kenya. And he says, you haven't. I said, yes, I have. <laughs> yeah. And he said, I said, what did you expect? You couldn't take me overseas like yeah. that and not expect me to keep going. And, and actually that trip to Kenya ultimately sort of brought me to where I am today. And that was at 18. So tell me about some of the experiences you had when you were like, was there any impressions that were like any specific stories that happened while you were in India that really resonated with you and, and stuck yeah. with you? So I was in Goa or just in between an, an, an area in Southern India. And I always remember I was sat on the beach and a girl came up to me and asked to paint my hands with henna. Mm -hmm. and we got talking and she spoke English and the two of us got talking and we spent the whole afternoon on the beach together talking, but it very much struck me that she was there to earn a living. And I just always remember that girl hearing about her life. I remember her telling me about the kids that she had at home, brothers and sisters. And whilst it wasn't something drastic in, in it was two girls sitting on the beach, I've never forgotten her. And I've never forgotten the two, we was age mates, um, mm -hmm. how different our lives were. And it's just struck me in, in a way that nothing else has. And also my dad and I did this massive hike up into the mountains, um, not quite Everest Base Camp, but up there. And along that road, I met a lot of, again, teenage girls. Mm -hmm. And that was also a big shift. I think the fact meeting other people and just the pure realization of the, the, the lottery that you win for where you're born. Um, I did think you that feel was... bad about that? <laughs> Ironically, I don't think I actually did feel guilty. I felt passionate. I felt angry. 
I felt like that's not okay. Mm -hmm. I think that was very much the the the, the direction I I left um, that trip with is I felt really like that's just not okay, and it yeah. lit something in me. And it, as I said, it totally changed the to direction that I took. You know, I'd previously not been that engaged in school, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I just became this. When I went back to the UK, I just became really into my studies, and I wanted to know everything that was about development and international development and children and rights. And I just became a little bit of a young activist, I guess, in my yeah. own right inspired on by that sort of anger that there's mm -hmm. it's so unjust and it's just that bit unfair is your anger directed towards anyone or anything or what what's the root or what was the root of it i think at the time i just think that i thought it was unfair that my life got to be that way for no doing of my own yeah i think that was very much that there was this inequality that wasn't fair and mm -hmm. didn't feel right to me and i think i was just angry that there was that there was not more being done. I guess at 16, you're also quite idealistic oh, <laughs> as sure. well. And so I definitely had that, but that was definitely the kind of impetus behind everything else that, that, that's kind of happened since then. It was definitely, that was the spark moment. Mm -hmm. So what so has what happened since happened? then? So as I said, at 18, I, I, I actually went to Kenya by myself. Um, and whilst I was there, I... I, I guess it was kind of a risky move. I met a company online that was running an orphanage and I ended up going over to volunteer there. And through hmm. that, through being there, what I learned whilst I was there that was actually most of the children in that home, I think it was approximately 120 odd children in that home, had family. And I really got kind of interested by that like it didn't make sense to me i came over with this very clear idea that orphans don't have family i was going to an orphanage orphanages host orphans and therefore right. and what i started to realize was that was across the board not true um and so after that so what trip, you're saying is that what was true is that orphan orphanages were full of kids who had parents Yes, or family. You know, I was yeah. hearing things like, I remember one day I was given the task of asking the children to sit with them and write letters to people, sponsors. And I was talking to them about, you know, maybe we, we can write about what you've done over the last few months. And they're telling me I went out for dinner with my auntie and I went for lunch with my mum and my mum took me. And I started thinking, are they lying? Is this like fantasy? Is this what they wish their mm -hmm. life was like? And the more I dug around, the more I realized, no, this is their life. This is real. <laughs> okay. This yeah. is real. Okay. And so that stuck with me. And then I, I subsequently kept taking follow-up trips. I I actually dropped out of university at this point in life um, because I wanted to change direction. And I mm -hmm. did. And I started... Um, spending a lot of time volunteering, a lot of time overseas, and I registered to do my degree online, focusing on East African development and children's rights, because I started to realize that there was a much bigger picture behind this, and that's, I think, where I became very engaged in the rights of children, especially orphaned and vulnerable children, mm -hmm. um, sort of came about from that trip to Kenya, yeah. What were some of your thoughts as you were discovering that you thought orphanages were good things. They were helping people mm -hmm. who needed help. And then you found out that maybe they're actually bad things. Like maybe mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, they do more harm than good. Yeah. What, what was, what were your, uh, how are you processing that transition in your mind? I think, again, I think my initial response was probably something, I, I got a little bit mad and I got a little bit frustrated because what I, what I, ultimately realized was it was a lot of good intention having a very bad impact and the intention didn't matter because mm -hmm. the impact was still the same and so I remember thinking you know we've got to raise awareness for this um you know that, that there's got to be more done and what I started to realize is the more you dug deeper the more complicated the problem got right. and I think it's really important because it's very much tied to what the work I do now um is that it's not easy and there's no clear cut answers. And the more you start to dissect the problem, the more you get that it's it's complicated. Mm -hmm. But I think under, underlying the whole, the whole issue around orphanage based care and care of vulnerable children is this premise that we can do better. And that's kind of my main been my main takeaway message from my time originally in Kenya and now the work that I do here in Tanzania is I think when it comes to care for vulnerable children and even orphans, that we can do better than, than the 
big orphanage solution that has really boomed, especially in places like East Africa. Right. So I, I want to come back to that. I want to come back to the complications around mm -hmm. giving. I think that's an important topic that people need to be yeah. really aware of and talk about. Like it's an important thing to talk about quite a sure. bit. But before we do that, why don't you tell us what you're doing in Tanzania right now, why you're passionate yeah. about it? Yeah. So I, I founded an organization here in Tanzania called Pomodoleo, and we work with orphaned and vulnerable children on community and family-based care. Um, and I, we consider ourselves a children's rights organization, so we really advocate for the rights of children. And the reason I say children's rights is because when we get involved with a child's situation, it can be multifaceted the way that we get in it, interact with that child. So we we don't we're not health, we're not education. We primarily provide social services to children, um, and this can be children who are, who have lost both parents, who are living with elderly relatives, whose parents have mental health issues, who the children themselves are HIV positive or living with other chronic illnesses, and increasingly more children who've experienced abuse and neglect. So we work with children. We have a range of programs that we that we run here. Both we have a big children's centre which provides day services for seventy five children and their families, and then we have a lot of outreach and community projects, sort of raising awareness about the key issues around um, care of orphans, um, uh, community based care, child abuse, and the key issues that our our, our population that we work with are facing. Um, How important is it to know about the specific issues involving your specific context there in your part of Tanzania? It's huge. And I think that that comes, you know, uh, we are nine uh, full-time staff members, all who are Tanzanian. My, I'm the only foreigner in the organization. Um, and even though some of our staff members come from different parts of Tanzania, even they consider themselves ignorant to the, the, the realities of our local population, um, which is quite interesting mm. because I think even people sometimes generalize Africa and then you can sort of generalize Tanzania, but it really goes down to tribe and region and it really changes. As you walk across Tanzania, the issues vary greatly. Mm -hmm. And so in our area, you know, teenage pregnancies and, and young pregnancy is a huge issue where you wouldn't find that so much sort of more inland areas that, 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 that that I know other people working in, whereas so every context is slightly different, and the the the, the, the causes underneath it definitely are quite unique in our area because we are a coastal region, so it has some different influences, cultural influences, and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, I want to just highlight what you just said and, and emphasize it because I think well one of the one of the ideas behind donorcy is that we are trying to empower people who are on the ground working in their specific context and. Mm that's a very different model than a lot of other charities which have a headquarters in the United States. And then these people in the, in the United States are making decisions that affect 50 or 75 or 100 different countries. And yeah. it's not just 100 different countries. Within each of those countries, there are a thousand different contexts. Um, yeah. and, and they can get, there's some amount of communication that happens between the head office and the people on the ground, but it's just unmanageable uh, yeah. at, at once you get to a certain scale. And so that's why I, I really, uh, that's that's why we designed Donorcy the way we did to mm -hmm. to just give put the power into the hands of people like you who are on the ground and understand the context very well, because yeah. it's not just how to how to uh, empower people well, but it's also like there's probably a lot of pitfalls. Like there's a lot of things that you could accidentally walk into and end up harming people yeah. in your specific context. And if you don't know about that, then you're in a then you can end up doing a lot more harm than good, unfortunately. Uh Absolutely. And there's often, I, I often get a little bit frustrated with it, especially with quite larger and um, charities or NGOs that come in um, to our area. Not that our area is actually quite underserved, but occasionally you get a big funded project coming through and they have all the key buzzwords. But I'm like, great, but come on, <laughs> yeah. Mike, uh -huh. you know, great idea, but that's really not the reality here and so i think having uh, systems that are more flexible to the realities of each individual community and climate is so important because i think the development of the charity sector as a whole is so often trying to find this standard standardized response you know these new buzzwords this is the mm -hmm. focus of the day and it leaves in its wake actually a lot of negative consequences that you only see if you can be responsive and that's something that 
we love about how donors has changed our operation is it made us responsive mm -hmm. we can like before it was so hard to be as responsive as we are now we're able to do things that we were previously not able to do so that's huge well, i want to <laughs> touch on something that you just said you, you brought up some of the buzzwords that people are saying and i thought that that's funny because um it for you know i have a younger looking face and so sometimes when i i meet someone there they they don't they they don't understand like how i lived in malawi for three years they don't understand the, mm -hmm. the you know all of my background and the things i've done in my life and so they might like try talking down to me or whatever so i mm -hmm. i realized that and then i realized if i just throw out a few buzzwords when i first meet someone like if i say the word sustainability ability yeah, <laughs> like, that's like all you have yeah. to that's all you have to yeah. do and people yeah. are like oh this guy he knows what he's talking about because yep. he said that word and really like it's it's just it's just a word like it, there, there are mm -hmm. real life actions and consequences mm -hmm. and the people on the ground are the ones who are most able to understand that that was something I, I think I just saw over and over again when I was in Malawi and you probably see this with other organizations when I was in Malawi there were like I was on the ground I was able to help people and be responsive like you talked about mm -hmm. and interact with donors be the be the the uh, liaison but there were a lot of organizations that were not able to do that they were mm -hmm. they were they were on the ground but it was like they were disconnected from the very communities that they were a part of absolutely and this is just a small anecdote just from the other day i was uh, i i i was called by the government social welfare team to tell me that there was a teenage girl in prison and she'd been left there for seven weeks and she she has no parents and um so i went down to the to the police station and i started trying to advocate for this girl and through that, I, I connected with a couple of other NGOs that work in paralegal services. So I went to them, I was told, you know, they, they could maybe help her legally. So I was down there and they said, sorry, our funding's run out. Hmm. You know, the, the, the funding organization said we need to become more sustainable. And I just thought Which to makes myself, perfect how? sense for a paralegal organization. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how can and their and their main programming was children in prison. Mm -hmm. And it just killed me to know that this great team had been trained and got together, but this buzzword sustainability had killed a program that mm -hmm. just needed people to see it still as real and alive. And that this idea that some things can't become sustainable, not in those ways, they mm -hmm. do need. This, this this support structures it was really interesting conversation yeah, that's yeah that, that's a fascinating that, that, story that, that really hits you when you think about these things goodness like sustainability can kill some of the greatest projects because mm -hmm. you phase them out to phase out support so quickly that it it actually hurts people in the end right it's not it it seems like a common sense thing that people want to do but it doesn't apply mm -hmm. to every situation and if you talk to people who are on the ground like you're on the ground but like when i was in malawi there were malawians mm -hmm. who were on the ground and i remember like I would like, what do you, when I was first learning about this stuff, I was, I would ask mm -hmm. them like, what do you guys think about sustainability? Do you think it's important? And they're like, yeah, it's important a lot of the times, but sometimes like there's a baby who's on, on the brink of starvation and it's not sustainable to like try and teach that baby to farm or something, either to yeah. like, like the baby needs its life to be saved. And if you go mm -hmm. for a sustainable solution, it will die. And then the mm -hmm. baby's dead because you're trying to be sustainable. And yeah. like that's, that's not even like an extreme, like that's actually what happens. That's not like an extreme, yeah. I'm not being, uh, Extreme. Yeah, yeah, not dramatic, right? That's that's actually how it how it works. In, mm -hmm. in so, um, yeah. Well, I I uh, I want to come back to some of the sure like like what you talked about. All this stuff it is very complicated, and mm -hmm. I know that some of our donors um, are very passionate about helping. I, our donors like love you. They love. Uh, is it Amy Hathaway? Is she the one who introduced us? Yes. Yes. Okay. So sh they love Amy. They love a whole bunch of uh, people mm -hmm. on the donor seed platform. But one of the things that they're realizing because usually when people give to charity, they give and they get a thank you email, and they're like, "Hey, we're taking care of your money. Don't worry about it." Mm -hmm. uh, but on donor seed, it's such an involved activity to donate. You give to. Yeah. Georgina, Georgina's programs, mm -hmm. uh, and Georgina's like explaining how it's helping someone. And one of the things I'm realizing as as this is happening is donors are realizing that these things are really complicated. Mm -hmm. So yeah. understanding that it's complicated, what would you say to people? Like you want people to be involved, I assume. Yeah. Like you want people in the states and in the UK and Australia, yeah. like all over the place. You want they have a little bit more income, a little bit more mm -hmm. wealth than other places mm -hmm. in the world, especially the people that you're working mm -hmm. with. What would you say to them? They know it's complicated. You know it's complicated. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with that? I think sometimes when we start to learn how complicated it is, the first response is sort of to pull back. And I think that's quite natural because we get become aware that we don't want to do harm. But I think the most important message is to 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 to, to push to do better. 
and there is ways and it it, it does fall unfortunately on donors to get educated mm -hmm. and to get involved and to ask those tricky questions and to not be afraid to sort of question where their money goes but also to sort of hold out that there is great work going on and necessary work and it does you know this is one of the things i'm quite passionate about especially trying to talk about we were talking previously about orphanages it's really awkward to try and criticize something that people think are good mm -hmm. is good no, and i no hate question. doing it yeah. i absolutely hate doing it but my absolute heart and intention with that is because i believe we can do better and i believe that if we all put a little bit more attention into trying to figure out how do we do it better look this is maybe the best we can do for now but what is better what does that look like and if all charities and ngos and development workers were working and donors were working with that mindset you know where what makes sense? What can we do to do better, to know better, to, to, to invest that money almost into better solutions? I think if we flip the thinking instead of just how do I meet that need, but how do I invest in a better solution, mm -hmm. you know, and, and realize that sometimes projects get it wrong. Sometimes, you know, it, it does go wrong, but it's worth it. And I do think as long as we're trying to always have that critical mindset, and I think actually criticizing to me is part of progress. Mm -hmm. To criticize our own practice, to criticize bad practice in a positive and constructive way is part of that allowing donors and practitioners to actually do better. So I think it's all about that, 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 that kind of looking for the ways, how do we do better, self-evaluation, how do I give better, invest better? Mm -hmm. And to not lose sight, you know, the hardest thing to lose sight of is the fact that at the end of this is real people and they don't ask certain NGOs to represent them. They just get given the people they get given and right. their needs are real. And so I think it's important to focus on the end person at the end of the day as well. Like, how do we better serve that person? And so Absolutely. that's... That, that, that that's my two cents i guess on that one mm -hmm. well that touches on an idea that i think about a lot like when 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 you think about charity and serving the poor uh and just anything involved in that sphere a lot of times the it's the way that people act mm -hmm. they're acting as if the most important person in a charitable interaction is the donor mm -hmm. and somehow that needs to change that needs to flip because if if we're acting like the donor is the most important person if, if they're the one if they're if we care the most about their feelings, then at the end mm -hmm. of the day, there's the charity will be underserved and the uh, the aid recipient, the, the poor mm -hmm. person will be underserved. And so, yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right to do that. The other thing I wanted to touch on was mm -hmm. you brought up the idea that um, when we give, like there will, it's important to criticize, it's important to understand that sometimes bad things happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think another thing, another thing I like to bring up is that not giving is also, that's also an action and not giving yeah. also has consequences. Yeah. So I don't think that the solution is like, not giving doesn't absolve you of consequences yeah. or absolve you of your responsibility. Absolutely. Um, both giving and not giving are, have co consequences and so mm -hmm. you can give and it can be poor you can not give and it can be good but like at the end of the day the best of all of those things is that you find a way to give well mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i think we, we, we talked about this actually with my team today how if things were easy it would have been done by now yeah. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know if these were easy problems to solve you know, it would just be going on all the time. We'd be solving issues left, right, and said, it is complicated. And I think the more important thing is not to say it's too hard or it's too messy, is to say, how do I join in this messy to try and figure out the messy with people? Mm -hmm. how, do yeah. I, how do I become part of this solution? And yes, it's complicated and there's a minefield of things to consider. But I also think people, in my opinion, we need to give more thought to our charitable giving. It comes from the heart, but it does need to be led by the head. And mm -hmm. I think those two things, that connection is important. To give better is to is to is to really engage in it, you know. And if we do see our charitable giving as an investment into people's lives, into a better world, into the end of you know, child abuse or neglect or starvation, if it's an investment in that, then I think we'd be a bit wiser with where we put our investment. And we I think we need to treat our charity, charitable giving like that investment like mm -hmm. no I'm gonna I'm gonna research it a little bit more I'm gonna think about it that little bit more you know just to make sure that we are investing in best practice that we mm -hmm. are giving to good you know good practice and I'm a huge ad for advocate for grassroots organizations I think people at the grassroots level are doing 
incredible work and I think they're they're almost also the hardest ones to see because they're so on the ground that they don't yeah, have the they don't have a brand that they're that's backing them up they're just on the yeah. ground in the remotest parts of the world doing their own work it's hard <laughs> to understand that's what I'm trying I want to to be like their brand like they're, yeah. they're like we're we're representing you guys we're if you want to find these grassroots people who are doing amazing work come to donor C and and we'll show you them and you can support them yeah I absolutely agree. I think gr the gr so investing in grassroots movements or grassroots initiatives is just, it will be a game changer. Mm -hmm. And I think more needs to be done with that. The, the high level stuff has, it, I, I believe it has its place, but it isn't impacting individuals' lives. It isn't transforming communities in the way that grassroots level work, I really believe can. Mm -hmm. So. And I think that word investing is the most appropriate word because you're right. Sometimes you can give and it can be, it can go badly. Like it can go south and that's, that stinks. But then also sometimes when you give, there are so many consequences, so many positive consequences that continue to happen for a long mm -hmm. time from that one time gift. Yeah. And so I think investment is really like, it's something that can grow. It's something that can, mm -hmm. that can go down, but really what you're looking for is something that can grow. And there's a lot of different ways you can give where, mm -hmm. where it's, it's similar to an investment. I want to bring up one more thing before we go. I think about this a lot. You came from uh, what, what what you would call a first world or a developed world mm -hmm. context, whatever mm -hmm. language you want to use. Um, mm -hmm. I also came from that. Do you do you feel that people who came from our background have, but like how how do you, how would you want people from our background to think about some of the people that that you work work with? For me, I think the biggest thing is that we need to see people as individuals. Um, and especially people in poverty, you know, I work with orphaned and vulnerable children. They tend to systematically, we assume we know what their lives are like. And I think the number one thing is, is actually, we need to really get to understand people in poverty as complex individuals who have thoughts and feelings, who struggle, but have their joy and to start seeing the poor uh, or the marginalized with some more humanity. Mm -hmm. I think dignity is the hu the biggest thing, and it's something that I really advocate for. You know, I've seen people turn down acts of uh, help to preserve their own dignity. I've seen the power that dignity plays in any human, no matter how desperate their lives are, when they hold on to that dignity. And I believe that our our relationships with people whose lives aren't as fortunate, or economically, or even socially, you know. Uh, um, giving, extending that dignity to their humanity, I think is so important. And I think it's a lesson that we all can take away that people are more than their poverty and that they're, they, that they always deserve that extension of, of, of dignity. Mm -hmm. And I think um, secondary to that, I think that there's a very big difference between sympathy and empathy. And I actually think that um, too often we look at the poor and we feel sympathy for them. And I really encourage more people to extend empathy because sympathy doesn't give them agency. And people in poverty do have agency. They want change. They are actors in their own lives and they're doing amazing work. I think we often see the work of the charities and forget the work that people in poverty have to do to pull themselves out of it. And so to start using more empathy towards people and saying, I get how hard it is, but you, you know, you're an agent of change in yourself and not feeling so, you know, sympathetic for people because, you know, people, especially children. I mean, my main work is with children and children blow my mind every day from the toughest circumstances, from the most outrageous forms of abuse or neglect or just, you know, everything that life could have stacked against them. And they're fighters and they're individuals who, who pull themselves out. You know, we provide the support, but they do the work. And I think that's a really important relationship that everybody needs to engage with the humanity of each other, no matter where in the world that we are. Well, I love the distinction that you made between empathy and sympathy. Uh, one of the things that I, I constantly wonder about for years and years and years, mm -hmm. I wonder about is how do you, what's, how do you create the space for empathy when, mm -hmm. when most of my, I don't know about you, but most of my friends have never met someone living in yeah. extreme poverty, and so. Yeah. Like for sure, they're they're a real person. I mean, some of my best friends are mm -hmm. uh, are, are from rural Malawi, and mm -hmm. we brought one out here to America. And like you know, I'm able to to understand them on a very deep level, and I'm able to have a relationship with them. And um, mm -hmm. but a lot of my friends, a lot of people I know um, here in the states, they don't have the same opportunity as me. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if they were interested in in being more empathetic, what would you say to them? I think I'd say we're in a world where we can connect with others um, and 
you know, no matter where, where in the world we are, where other people are, there's always resources, I think, that allow us to engage with others. I also think just trying to understand the culture of somewhere distant, you know, not seeing Tanzania just for its poverty, but for its music and for its culture and for its diversity, we can start to add more layers to the people that, mm. that, that we seek to, you know, invest in or be interested in. And I'd also say, you know, organizations, grassroots organizations following along with charities, they can really allow people to get an access and an investment into people's lives and understand it, especially people that do a lot of advocacy work. There's great resources online that you can really engage with the stories that people are telling. I, I, I follow a number of things on Instagram, for example, that tell great stories about the lives of, you know, everyday Africa. And, and it, it's definitely added to my kind of richness of understanding the world. So I think there's always ways. I think it's just an intentional space as well to be in is to say, no, I want to connect more and I want to understand the, the complexity and the diversity that's there and to go beyond that actually, yeah, you know, I wonder what what it is like to be in that person's shoes. I wonder how they do feel, you know, and, and to extend that next step, going from kind of watching to kind of trying to engage more. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of a, any in whatever means we can. Yeah, well, that's really good advice. Before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to share with, with this audience? Uh, it's an audience of people who are really interested in learning more about um, all of the the different issues in our world that don't get as much attention. So what, what would you like to say to them? Well, I mean, I didn't get to touch on my big um, sort of- Let's talk I about it. To say about yeah, orphanages. Of course, okay, um, let's do it. Because I don't want to leave you hanging on that way. So <laughs> I think, <laughs> and so with, with, with orphan, I do a lot of work on orphanage care reform. And I'm not saying by any means that orphanages are bad. I'm saying that they've been misused as a solution. And, I, um, our team here in Tanzania, we approached the government and we wanted to know why are children in orphanages here in our town specifically? And what we found was that data is not collected. And the more that we looked into it, we found actually universally that the data of why is not collected. So we set about collecting that data and we interviewed every child living in an orphanage in our town. And what we found kind of um, sat with what our suspicions were and what general research sort of said, which is about 80% of children living in orphanages have living parents of one, both, or you know, either or. Mm -hmm. And even more have extended relatives. And that the main reasons that children were in orphanages is what I would call, what I start to type to break down into two reasons, family in crisis or a failing family. And what I mean by that is things like a parent died, they got a diagnosis, some sort of crisis happened in their life and the solution or the, the, the help offered was, let me take your child. And what Pomodileo is all about, you know, wow. and, and, on off, and that can come about in many different reasons. Now I can go from the nice reasons well, let me ask you about that. Why, why are people taking kids? Why are the orphanages bringing in these kids? Um, I've seen a spectrum. Okay. Um, some people, that is the best solution that they know to offer, right? They have no other solutions. Others, they think that a life out of poverty is better than a life in poverty. And I think that's a, an ideological thing in some ways. I don't agree with that. I think uh, poor people deserve to be parents and poor families can make good families and it's about strengthening the family not removing the child but some people would have a different ideological perspective I can say on that one I've seen it way all the way down mm. to um some often just recruit children they go out to villages and they literally sign up kids because it has become I mean I, I read a statistic somewhere recently that in Uganda a quarter of a billion dollars has gone into funding orphanages in Uganda yeah. I mean that's mega money and for many it's become a way of life it's become a business it's become the only thing that they know how to do to make an income it's just become a misused solution and what you start to when you start to un unwrap the layers many orphanages aren't even registered they're running their own entities um and what we found is it's become this solution like a child in need send them to the orphanage and what homogeneity is about is saying no we need to categorize why that child is in need and come up with better solutions. You know, so um, Amy, you know, is a great example of that. She's yeah. managed to get babies out of orphanages by prov providing formula to the families. I mean, that is like, that's, that's a breakthrough. That's a pushing ourselves further saying, how can we do this better? Because we also know that orphanages aren't great environments for kids to grow up. You know, the UN did this study in 2009 that found that children in orphanages are at higher risks of 
all forms of abuse, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, that their developmental delays are significant compared to their peers, even their peers in poverty. So what we start to, when you start to dig a little deeper, what you start to realize is the orphanage has consequences, and only when it is the last resort should it be utilized. And the last resort meaning, you know, abuse, severe neglect, you know, life and death situations, then it can be a great temporary solution, but it also shouldn't be a solution for life. Mm -hmm. And that is another big problem that we find here is kids that go in rarely come out. Yeah. And reunification and building up the family is a big is a big part of it. So the point I think is that it, it isn't a one size fit all. And I think the biggest undermining pin of that is children in orphanages aren't orphans on the whole. If you were to say a global statement, that is a very factual statement. Mm -hmm. And even orphans have family. And that's something that I often come against. You know, I say we work primarily with orphans in, in Pomodileo and their families. And people say, huh, orphans have families? I'm like, yes, grandmas, aunts, sisters, all. We've worked with all those extended relatives currently. We've got children that we're working with who are living with a sole caregiver is an older sister. Their sole caregiver is an 85 year old grandma. Their sole care care caregiver is a disabled, you know, a single mum. It's possible. And it, it, it takes better programming. It's harder. Dealing with families is harder than dealing just with the child. But it's worth it because families, I believe, and I think research does back up, families are the best solution. And investing in families is a better long term investment for children. Um, and so that's kind of a summary of a complicated issue. I, I love it. No, that was so good. That was like, yeah. that was a, a great way to sum up some of the things that you're passionate about. Um, I'm, I'm like, you overwhelmed me with data because like one of the, one of the like 20 things that you brought up was this idea that kids in orphanages uh, are, are more malnourished than kids in poverty. That's astounding to me. I didn't know that. There's a, a lot of those things I had heard before, but I had, I had no idea about that. Yeah, and quality of care varies. I mean, quality of care definitely varies. And there is, but, but the problem is, is we've got to also see investing in an orphanage is a pull factor as well. The more people think the only hope is the orphanage because we're diverting friends away from families, that's also part of the problem. There's this pull factor as well, that mm. there needs to be more investment in family solutions, family strengthening, which in my experience in East Africa is very underfunded sector. You know, funding to strengthen families over funding to remove the child. And that is actually a big part of the of that puzzle is often people invest in the orphanage. So you might they might start getting the food in very well-funded orphanages, they start getting their material needs. But we also then have to look at the emotional consequence, the connect disconnection from community, their disconnection mm -hmm. from family identity, um, their risk factors by being, you know, one one caregiver to 40 children. All those things are risk factors. And so it is, I think it's a challenge. It's one of those areas that we can say, how do we do better by orphans? How do we do better by vulnerable children? And we're currently, we're really trying to invest in encouraging more Tanzanian families to become foster families and saying you know when a child is in crisis let the community respond and we're getting responses people say no they won't do it but they will mm -hmm. you know Tanzanians are stepping up all over the place saying yeah I want to be part of this solution a better solution for children and so I think it's a huge advocacy work but I think just touching upon it, it, it it's definitely something that if people are interested in issues of orphaned and vulnerable children it's definitely something worth investigating more mm -hmm. and it's not that question of saying all orphanages are bad they are needed and they are part of a solution but we could close down so many of them right yeah <laughs> you know we really could yeah. and we could do with the few that are doing a really good job at what they do you know providing that temporary immediate interim care they're needed mm -hmm. but there's so much bad practice out there that I think also needs to be addressed. So this is something I'm wondering about, and this is something I care about. Like I've got my mm -hmm. Instagram and my YouTube mm -hmm. channel and podcasts and stuff. I care a lot mm -hmm. about getting the word out. And this strikes me as such an important issue. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about the people on our planet who are maybe the most vulnerable people that you could possibly mm -hmm. imagine. And, uh, and, and they're not being given adequate, care or, or or they're being disserved and um i understand that there's a lot of nuance there but mm -hmm. um but what i mean what do you think about the magnitude of the problem what what do you see uh, if, if you were to look at your at yourself or the work that you're doing or mm -hmm. um any of this stuff s several years into the future what do you want to see happen how do you want to see a change take place 
I think the biggest thing, and we're starting to see it, I think it's very hopeful. In, in East Africa region, Tanzania is, is a little bit further behind than every, the rest of the region. Okay. Um, but in East Africa, we are seeing political change. The problem is I fear that it will be knee jerk. Um, you know, that we say all orphanages are bad, all orphanages are good. That's what and just I happened in that, Uganda. They just yes, said all I, orphanages are bad and now they're just shutting down orphanages left and, and right. And it's like, that whoa. is dangerous. That is dangerous. And that's not what I'm saying. My, my, my thing is, my, 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 my main point is, how do we listen to kids more? How do we understand? Because there, and there is a great body of work coming out of children raised in orphanages that I spend a lot of time engaging with to really understand their experiences. And they've got a lot to say, especially when they've been given the freedom to say it. You know, children start to say, yeah, that, that wasn't the best. And I wanted to go home to my mum and I wish somebody had helped me connect with my grandma. And, and there is that sense there. So I hope that the voices of children who've been raised in, the, in orphanage care are lifted up because I think we can learn a lot I from love that. that. Yeah. I, I also hope that we strengthen social welfare. You know, I'm actually working with universities here in Tanzania at the moment to try and get that this this field more studied by social workers so that the next generation of social workers here in Tanzania understand this more because currently it, it's not explored as it should be so I'd love to see a generation of social workers mm -hmm. who are who are who are trained to really understand the nuance to not say all good and all bad but to really understand this idea of last resort temporary solution mm -hmm. to really encourage foster care to take off in East Africa I think that would be an absolutely amazing um thing to to, to, to say you know when a family fails or when a family is unable let other families step up that was the old traditional African way and I think um that we need to go back to that I think charity has con contributed to the disintegration when we undermine the family when we don't give them the space to step in when we say we'll take the, the problem, the orphan or the vulnerable child out of the community. I think it's actually ultimately a disservice to the community as a whole. And we need to empower communities to get back involved and saying, no, orphans, struggling children, children who are HIV positive, children who are living with disabilities, they belong in our communities. And that's where I think a lot of the work needs to be focused to start creating that enabling environment and funding family services it, it is one of my biggest gripes is, you know, if we could fund more daycares so that mm -hmm. struggling single mums who just lost their husband have somewhere they can take their child so they can go to work and they don't feel the need to relinquish to an orphanage. You know, if we had more services to help grandmas, you know, farm or start a business and then they would say, Do you know, what? I don't need to let go of my grandchildren. I can care for them. I think it's investment back into the people that really are the heart of these children's lives. Um, and so that's what I see. I really hope for a more family focused and child focused system that 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 focuses on it's complicated, but we can do better and mm -hmm. working towards it. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I, you know, and I get that there's always those one or two cases that they're nuanced, but I, I just want the conversation to get more nuanced. I think mm -hmm. that's that's one of my big goals. And we don't keep seeing Kids in orphanages lack families. I think we need to challenge that thinking. Kids in orphanages overwhelmingly have families. Now let's go about thinking, how do we get them back to those families, build those families up, give those families skills to, to be the family that that child needs. So I think yeah. it's a shift in thinking. It's not seeing the child isolated. It's seeing their why, who they exist within, the family, the community, the church, you know, who is around that child and how do we work with those people to keep that child where they belong. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that. Yeah, well, that's, that's exactly right. It's where they belong. And I I think that um, I re resonate so deeply with what you're saying that that more that more conversation needs to happen and more nuance needs to happen. <laughs> that's why I'm doing the podcast. That's why I'm doing this YouTube channel. Uh, like we're just getting started, but like I think yeah. that, I think lots of people would be interested in, in, in these types of conversations. Mm -hmm. and, and now we have the capacity to make a podcast and have people share it and I hope that people will do that with this with this episode because what what you've talked about is like skimming the surface, but yeah, also I know. I've, not I've talked to... about. Yeah, it's so good. In something in something so complicated, it is hard to have a general discussion, and I, I'm always trying to make sure that people that I communicate the the understanding that it's not all good and all bad. I think that is the number one take. It is just challenging our thinking, mm -hmm. and that there's it's complicated, and that's a good thing. The more complicated it feels, probably the more open your eyes are, you know, the more complicated yes. you feel, the more confused, it's almost the better mm -hmm. because it is complicated. These are hard issues. But my, my biggest goal is to start seeing more people 
support these ideas, investigate mm-hmm. them further. And I just think that's all it is. It's the start of that conversation that we start to challenge, you know, things that we held as true. Like my 18 year old self in Kenya, when I started to realize, hang on a second, why are 120 kids separated from their families, you know, yeah. when they still have them? It's just that initial questioning that allows us to start getting to better solutions. And there are better solutions out there. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah. Well, that's, it's just amazing that, uh, that you, are exemplifying this with the work that you're doing and with the passion that you're clearly exuding in this one conversation. <laughs> I think that's that's really wonderful. And um, I think we're gonna see, I I, I hope that people resonate with this. I, I see that we have a few comments. One person says that ext- this is awesomely informative and uh, they believe that family is always the correct way to fix a lot of issues in our culture. And so we're, I, my hope is that that people hear this conversation and and they hear it and they digest it and maybe they share it with a few people. They talk about it around the dinner table. They mm-hmm. they talk about it with their friends, because like what's more important? Like there's we the 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 level of discourse of of things that are talked about versus things like this that are not talked about but so important. I, could, <laughs> I want to scream sometimes. So, um, anyways. Yeah, and if people so have questions, I'm send them my way, and I'm happy to try and answer things as best as I can. I do spend a lot of time advocating about this, so I'm yeah. I'm always yeah. happy to be a resource. This is definitely my passion. Um, mm, <laughs> this is I'm absolutely sure. my That's passion. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's it, it's also my life. You know, I live, eat, and breathe mm-hmm. working with children and their families, and I and I love spreading that message so mm-hmm. that more families and more children can be served through the ripples, you know? So any questions, shoot them my way and I'm always happy to try and, or we can talk again. <laughs> you and I will talk again. I also had an idea while you were saying this, you were saying that um, it would be helpful if orphans had had more of a voice. So while mm-hmm. you're in Tanzania, if you ever come across an orphan who has good English and can, artic- mm-hmm. can articulate some of these things well, um, I, I would be happy to have them on this on this show and give them well, the I'm, opportunity to- I, I actually have to- Mostly in Kenya because Kenya the, the the English language is more spoken than in Tanzania. Gotcha. I actually I actually know a couple of girls who were raised in orphanages. Who one of them is my daughter's godmother now. <laughs> um, nice. We're quite oh, close. Okay. Um, but, she would be an excellent person to to chat to. She's mm-hmm. older. Here in Tanzania, it's a bit harder because of the language barrier. For sure. um, but we've actually, at Pomodileo, we've started using photography as a medium to get children to express themselves. And I'll happy to show you the link to some mm-hmm. of the photos that have been taken. Um, this is all children we work with in communities who are all orphaned or living in vulnerable family situations. And the photographs are amazing. And I just, and that is another medium of expression. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we're about to hop off here, but afterwards you and I, you and I will talk about some of the links that you've talked about, some of the Instagram profiles that you thought would be helpful for people to understand empathy. Um, And then we'll include a way for people to contact you, maybe through Instagram or something like that. Yeah, fantastic. If they have further questions, they can do that. And then Mm -hmm. we'll talk again. We'll, I'll talk Mm -hmm. to your friend from Kenya and we'll keep these conversations going because I have absolutely loved the last 45 minutes or whatever it's been. Oh, me too. This has been fun. I was nervous before we did this. You didn't come across. You did a great job. I, I held it in. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Any parting words before uh, we hang up? Oh, it's just been a pleasure. And I feel really honored to be able to do something like this. You know, I feel some, I, I'm in quite a, isolated part of Tanzania Mm -hmm. um so I don't get to speak freely in English that often (laughs) um, which is definitely the language I can express myself in more than Swahili because my Swahili Mm. is quite bad um so it's a pleasure and it and it makes what we do here feel like it's great to reach an audience that I you know and to hopefully inspire or just you know move someone in some way or to even highlight the stories that I get to witness to people that that maybe don't I think it's such an amazing privilege of mine to be able to have done this so I, I thank you for that because <laughs> I, I it feels really special to be able to talk to I don't know who but you know mm. Americans that I never would have known <laughs> yeah. before and, mm-hmm. and tell them tell them some of these messages so it's been a real privilege thank you <laughs> yeah absolutely and and uh you, you know that I'm like one of your biggest fans and I will, oh, I will support you <laughs> to the end of the earth so um so I, I will we'll continue to stay in touch and and uh, and thank you for being on. Thank you. Thank you very.